On Egypt's Giza Plateau, the Sphinx stands guard over the pyramids, the oldest and most famous structures in the world. We've come to believe they were built simply as tombs for ancient pharaohs. But were they? Or do new investigations point to a much larger purpose? One that could even change our ideas about when civilization began. The pyramids were built during Egypt's fourth dynasty, about 4,500 years ago. They're one of the seven wonders of the world, monuments whose mysteries have provoked centuries of debate. Egyptologists insist that they were tombs, the same as other pyramids along the Nile Valley. But now a new breed of investigators is asking questions and challenging that idea. Sleuths like Robert Pavel, a construction engineer, and writer Graham Hancock. Textbooks say that these pyramids were royal tombs like all the others, but no mummies were found inside Giza, no inscriptions, nothing. Besides, some of these fourth dynasty pharaohs built two pyramids. Why? Did they intend to be buried in both places at once? And why did none of them leave inscriptions? Why did none of them make clear to posterity that he was the owner? Ask yourself this. If you'd just built the biggest tomb in human history after decades of cost and effort, would you leave the world guessing about your identity? Isn't it likely that there's something much more to all this than just tombs and tombs only? Could this be part of some very different scheme? The date Egyptologists fix as the beginning of Egyptian civilization is 3000 BC, about 500 years before the pyramids were built. Before that, they claimed the land was populated by Stone Age wanderers. Bovel is skeptical. According to the textbooks, Egypt only just emerged from the Stone Age. And suddenly, just like that, we're able to produce these enormous and perfect structures. And all this for what? To cover the body of a dead king. This tomb-only theory doesn't make sense. And despite a hundred years of scientific investigation, many vital questions remain unanswered. The pyramids on the Giza Plateau are unlike any ever built in Egypt before or since. Their predecessors from the Third Dynasty are mountains of crumbling brick. Their fifth century successors are piles of rubble. Hancock explains. It's as though in the Third Dynasty they built the Model T Ford. In the Fourth Dynasty, they built the Porsche. Then in the Fifth Dynasty, for some bizarre reason, they reverted to the penny-farthing bicycle of pyramids. It really doesn't make any kind of sense. The pyramids don't excite everybody's curiosity. Egyptologists aren't much interested in them and believe that speculation, especially about the Great Pyramid, has gone too far. Uh, pyramids, in general, are not very popular with, uh, with Egyptologists because I think they're too plentiful. There are about a hundred of them. Uh, and also, I, I think they've acquired something of a bad name because they've attracted so many cranks. The Great Pyramid has this power over people. Um, in my view, it has the power to, to destroy common sense. 
But if the pyramids were simply tombs, then why were the Egyptians so obsessed with the pyramids' dimensions and with their orientation on the Earth? They lie almost exactly along the 30th parallel. The relationship of the Great Pyramid's circumference to its height is the same as that of the Earth's circumference to its radius from the pole. Egyptologists don't dispute this. They just deny that it was done on purpose. Is this a simple coincidence? Or is it possible that these people knew the exact shape and dimensions of the Earth? Miraculously, too, these gigantic structures are impeccably aligned to the cardinal directions. Perfectly east-west and perfectly north-south. The precision of these alignments is uncanny and hasn't been achieved in any modern structure. How is it possible that such precision could have been achieved almost 5,000 years ago? 500 years ago, our own civilization wasn't even sure that the Earth is a sphere. And it wasn't until 300 years ago that we knew for certain the exact dimensions of the Earth. But these people knew, because the Great Pyramid turns out to be a mathematical model of the Northern Hemisphere on a scale of 1 to 43,200. The Great Pyramid also incorporates the value of pi in its construction a transcendental number thought to have been discovered by the Greeks. And even the slope of the pyramid's walls is odd and complicated. It's clear that what we have here is an advanced system of mathematics and technology at a time when this isn't supposed to have existed. And to achieve these results, the ancient builders had to use a slope of 52 degrees any other slope just won't work. Can all these things be coincidence? The accuracy of these monuments is almost obsessive. Take the size of the Great Pyramid. They're each 755 feet long, yet the average variation in the side length is barely five inches. We're talking 0.01 of a single percent. Such incredible precision would stretch to breaking point the capacities of modern construction crews. So it's hard to imagine how it was done by primitives only just emerging from the Stone Age. There's still more worth pondering, like the size of the building blocks. Some of these blocks, high up in the body of the Great Pyramid, each weigh as much as a hundred family-sized cars. Egyptologists remain strangely unpuzzled by this, but frankly, we're very puzzled indeed. I'm an engineer, and I can tell you that to raise blocks of this size to such heights requires a special crane. Now, for a people who did not have that sort of machines, not even the simplest pulley or the wheel, and using simple copper tools, how could they do this? Deep within the pyramid, inside a room called the King's Chamber, there is a granite chest so skillfully made it would challenge even modern-day machines. Chris Dunn is a drilling expert. This is an incredible piece of work and a mystery. How did they do it? The typical way of doing it primitively would be with a bow saw, a bow drill, and uh, they would advance the, the tool into the piece using sand or a uh, diamond. And to me, that would just take too, too long, too many years to do this. But let me ask you this, how do you think they did it? I think that they had to have used some power tool. Uh, today, if we were to drill this, we would advance the drill into the granite at a rate of two ten thousandths of an inch per revolution of the drill. Do you think their drills could possibly have been turning as fast as that? No. They were advancing a lot faster than that. Faster? Faster. The drills were advancing into the granite at a rate of one hundred thousandths of a revolution. The investigators admit the idea is controversial. But the fact is, the Egyptians were able to cut granite and even diorite, the hardest stone in nature, and drill out the inside of diorite vases where modern-day tools couldn't even reach. How did they do this? 
In the king's chamber, there's another mystery the investigators don't think has been adequately solved. This is the real mystery. Cutting through the wall are a number of precision-made shafts. Egyptologists claim they're ventilation shafts, air conditioning for the dead monarch. But there's no way these could have been ventilation shafts. The detail of design is far too complicated. They rise on the incline all the way out of the pyramid. They must have had a much higher purpose. But what kind of purpose? Barvel and Hancock began to believe the 5,000-year-old monuments were built to send a message to future generations. The investigators wanted to decipher that message and turn to astronomy for clues. Scholars say that the ancient Egyptians did not have a high knowledge of astronomy. But here is evidence of their fascination and sophisticated knowledge of the sky. Look at the zodiac constellations. Leo, Taurus, Pisces, and here the constellation of Orion and the star Sirius. Bavel was convinced the shaft from the king's chamber was targeted at the constellation of Orion. He Resurrection was also the goal of Egypt's pharaohs. Now when a pharaoh died, his body was mummified and prepared like Osiris, and his soul was ready to ascend to the sky. His earthly mission fulfilled, and the dead king would depart to the sky. In effect, what we have here is a reenactment of the resurrection myth of Osiris told in stellar terms. Pavel believes the purpose of the pyramid shafts was to send the pharaoh's soul to its place next to Osiris, and he's found compelling support. I'm taking you inside the pyramid of Unas, one of the kings who immediately followed the fourth dynasty. And here are the oldest religious writings in history. These are the pyramid texts, and they hold the key to the mystery of the pyramids. The meaning of these texts were nearly forgotten because Egyptologists saw in them mainly a sun religion. But this isn't a religion of the day and the living. This is a religion of the night and of the dead. These texts repeatedly tell us that the king becomes a star in the kingdom of Osiris, in the constellation of Orion. One of these texts says, O oh, king, you are a companion of Orion. And another text says, may you traverse the winding waterway, the Milky Way. And may you go to the place where Orion is. There's no doubt in my mind that the Egyptians were the inheritors of an ancient knowledge and wisdom. It's absurd to suggest, as Egyptologists do, uh, that these monuments were the creation of the infancy of a civilization. There's a huge accumulated knowledge and wisdom expressed in these monuments. These monuments, to me, are the end of something, not the beginning of something. To me, this almost impossible engineering feat conveys one clear message. Speaking to us across the gulf of ages, what the ancients are saying is we were not fools. And we weren't simpletons dancing after superstitious priests. We will show you our knowledge and precision. We did nothing by chance. Take us seriously. It's called the Sphinx. Egyptologists insist it was made 4,500 years ago when the three great pyramids were built. Others say the Sphinx was really built 8,000 years before the pyramids, at a time when no civilization should have existed. All these people, they come by for a day or two to the plateau, and they come by with a theory, and they publish it. The theory has to be crazy. The theory has to be fantastic, because if you make a fantastic theory, you will make money and you will be famous. 
many theories like this has been said about the Sphinx, but all of it gone with the wind. Because we Egyptologists have a solid evidence to state that the Sphinx is dated to the time of Kefren, the builder of the second pyramid at the Giza Plateau. Money isn't the issue here. I've been doing this for 20 years without making a bean out of it. We've got to get to the bottom of this. The issue is to find the truth, and we require several disciplines to find out what all this is all about. I don't think that Egyptology is up to the task at all. To come to a site like this with a one-dimensional view, a narrow perspective, and to claim that through that narrow funnel we can interpret uh, this site is a grave disservice to humanity because it's prevented other disciplines from exercising their intelligence here. Well, nobody was looking for it. It's a bit like uh, if you're looking for potatoes, you can walk right through a field full of diamonds and see a lot of nasty glittering stones. So the geology was simply taken for granted. Nobody looked for it, nobody found it. West's conclusion is based on the Sphinx's extremely distinctive pattern of weathering. You don't even have to be a geologist to look at it and see what must have been responsible for that kind of weathering. Only water pouring in sheets over the enclosure wall could have produced those rounded contours. Though the age of any stone is difficult to determine, a history of the rock can be constructed by looking at the characteristics of its erosion. When stone is exposed to wind and sand, the telltale sign is that the layers appear soft and scoured out. This kind of erosion is found everywhere in Giza. But the Sphinx and its surrounding pit are worn differently. These show a different kind of erosion altogether, a round, undulating profile, usually caused by rainwater and torrential downpours. When confronted with this evidence, Egyptologists theorized that the flooding of the Nile could have caused the damage. West disagrees. No, absolutely not, because the Nile floods would come in from the bottom, and if it had been flooding by Nile waters, you'd have a different pattern of erosion. You'd have the walls undercut. In other words, you'd have the deepest erosion at the bottom, not at the top. And you also wouldn't get those deep fissures. West's discovery raised many questions. In a debate, geologists sided with West. Egyptologists have offered few replies to his conclusions. Journalist Paul Roberts covered the controversy. West is really an academic's worst nightmare because here comes somebody way out of left field with uh, a thoroughly well thought out, well presented, coherently described, uh, beautifully written, full of data you can't refute, and it pulls the rug from beneath your feet. So how do they deal with it? They ignore it. They hope it'll go away. And it won't go away. Repair work done on the Sphinx seems to lend credence to West's theory. Here we're looking at a section of the earliest repairs. You see that some two to three feet of repair blocks were necessary in order to bring the Sphinx back to its original contours. We're told that these repairs were done within 300 years of the original carving of the Sphinx. Now the question arises, why would three feet of repairs been necessary over the course of just some 300 years? Egyptologists insist that the stone the Sphinx is carved from is of such poor quality that it weathered away three feet in just 300 years. This presents another problem. If the stone the Sphinx is carved from is of such poor quality, and the Sphinx was carved 4,500 years ago, it means that at the erosion rate of a foot a century, the Sphinx would have disappeared some 500 years ago. Well, it hasn't. Every civilization refers to a creation myth, a beginning. But the Egyptians were uh, extremely um, uh, clear about what had happened in the beginning. They tell us the earth was totally covered with water and that uh, the physical, the material earth sprang out of the water and we had a primeval mound on which creation began, on which there was the first dawn, the first sunrise. It's as if, for example, the king who built those pyramids was reenacting that moment, that, that time of the gods. It would be normal 
for them to want to, to commemorize it, to, to, to freeze it, if you like, in a grandiose expression. I think if there is the original primeval mound, that's it, Giza. Indeed, the texts refer to the place of Giza, of Heliopolis, as being the location of creation. Perhaps we should take them literally. They tell us that this is the place of creation.